<laughs> well, lovely to see you, Swanikas, and I hope you're going to have a fabulous week. It's now 47 years since I first came to Swanik on the pink cloud that Viv now has at the moment because the night school teacher had told me I'd got something. I was going to be a writer. And I thought, that's it. I'm definitely going to. I'd had to give up teaching because my sight had failed. Uh, I had four small children and I desperately needed something to give vent to the way I felt, you know, the catharsis that we all need. And writing was ideal. And my night school teacher said, you're going to be a novelist. There's no two ways about it. You just got that feel about you. So that was the start of my career 47 years ago. And I apologise to Mike because I thought I was the longest standing member of Swanick. But I'm not. He beats me by a year. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the first year I came to Swanick, um, in the mid-60s, Mother of four young children, my parents took over and let me go to Swanick because my night school teacher said I should. And I came here and I was so knocked out by the atmosphere. You probably felt it this week, it's been here every year that I've been here. There's a, a charge in the air, an electricity. Uh, I, I think it's a creative thing. That, that charge, you can't deny it, it's always there year after year. And I was, uh, I was at home. I was with like-minded people. These were my people. And I came back to Swanick year after year. Now that very first year, the magic of Swanick hit me hard because the woman at, who at that time was the then presenter of Woman's Hour, long before Jenny Murray, she was here planning to do a series of programs on writers writing and writers clubs in particular. And she said, to study from the platform here, would any of you who'd like to make comments about writers clubs come and see me in room so and so and I'll record you. So of course half of Swanick rushed to, <laughs> to be recorded, me amongst them. But I heard all these people saying, oh writers clubs marvellous, we all read our work to each other and, was, and I thought yeah it all sounds very self-congratulatory this. So I'm going to play devil's advocate. And when it was my turn to be interviewed, and I said, um, I think writers' clubs are terrible. It, it, it encourages you to think you're brilliant and you don't improve. So she said, Can you stay behind? I want to see. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, to cut a long story short, um, she liked the sound of my voice, and as we said, of half the night cutting tape. In the days when tape, you know, had to be cut with a razor blade and some tape and all that. And we wound up with mountains of tape three feet high. But luckily my piece was still in the edited version that went on it. And she wrote to me and asked me would I like to appear on Woman's Hour, because I had this low register voice. Asked me to write a piece specifically. I had voice test, went to London and great. My writing career had started as a broadcaster really. <laughs> and shortly after that, um, the local radio stations were sprouting up all over the country, including Radio Merseyside, where I lived at the time. And she recommended me to Radio Merseyside, and to cut a long story short, I had a, a weekly broadcast there for quite some time. I didn't know, but round about the same time, here in Derby, there was a young man who also wanted to be a writer, who kept entering BBC Radio Derby's writing competitions year after year. And they had to enter a story, as Vivian did, under a pen name. And he entered the first year calling himself Byro. <laughs> he won. The second year he entered again and he signed himself Papermate. <laughs> and he won again. Then the third year he entered and signed himself Parker 51. Parker 51, thank you. <laughs> and Radio Derby rang him up and said, are you by any chance Parker 51? And they said, yes I am. And they said, well look, if you withdraw your story, we'll give you some work on radio. Now that was Derek London and that was his start. And he got regular work then on Radio Derby and wrote for them, I should think, about 30 years, wasn't it? Long time. But it was curious that it turned to different parts of the country. We were both branching out in broadcasting and we didn't meet until 20 odd years later. And that again was the magic of Swanick for me because 
I was here um, by then a published writer. I'd written quite a few books. And Derek was sent here on a commission from Radio Derby to gather material by uh, interviewing established writers and writing a series of six programmes. Now, I was one of the people that he interviewed. And I loved the sound of his voice. He liked mine. And somehow we got together and decided that it would be rather nice if we tried to write something together. Now, Derek's wife at that time was a very ill woman. She'd been in bed for quite a long time. She was bedridden with a dreadful illness that was never really given a name properly at the time. It was said to be ME later, but if it was, it was the most severe form of ME I've ever come across. And Derek and I thought it would be rather a good idea if we wrote a, a television thing um, establishing really how the public should treat the disabled. Because Diana lived life at, at naval level in a wheelchair. And I couldn't see, I was always walking into things. <laughs> and so between us, I, mean, I remember Derek letting me wheel Diana in the wheelchair once and he was, he, he was horrified. He thought, doesn't it come back home safely <laughs> in one piece? But he, we were trying to write this piece on, on the, uh, you know, treating the disabled. And um, Diana wanted to know who this woman was that Derek was writing with, naturally. And she came over and we became, as I'll cut a long story short, we became good friends. Um, the, the piece we were going to write never, in fact, took off. A couple of years later, Diana died very suddenly, very tragically. And it was a very sad state of affairs and how Derek, as you can imagine, was absolutely shattered as it were his children. And um, shortly after that, he couldn't bear to stay in the house, you know, where she died sadly. And um, he came to stay in my house and his daughter Sally came to stay with me. And he started to write. Um, he, he gathered up, first of all, all the funny pieces that he had written for Radio Derby, describing his domestic life, where he had to be head cook and bottle washer. He was the one who went to Marks and Spencer's and put the washing the washing machine and so on, because Diana was so ill. And he wrote, he got together all these funny pieces and we were sent to, to my agent. And my agent said, yeah, they're brilliant. But she said, you're only showing one side of life here. It's all humor all the way. I want to see the pain, because there's obvious a lot of pain going on here. So he came home and he said, I can't write a book, it's too long. I only ever write four minute pieces for radio. But, give him credit, he stuck at it. And if they're feeling low, dispirited, there is in his work that warmth, that uplift, that brings them back up again and makes them feel whole and restored. Now a man who can write that, that like that, is a very gifted man in, indeed. And I make no apology for saying that I am extremely proud of my husband. He used to say that I had a degree, he hadn't. He left school at 15. And he used to say that he couldn't possibly write, you know, like Thomas Hardy or anybody. And I said, well, you're lucky, because I'm still influenced by having read Hardy and D.H. Lawrence and all that. Whereas you are unmarred by education. You are you. And this is the important thing about any kind of writing. You must be you, and not a pale shadow of somebody else. This, I think, is why I'm so proud of Derek. He laboured hard. People would read his books and say, it's so easy reading his book. It's as though he's sitting there across the table chatting to me. And indeed, that is the, the effect it has on you. But it's not that easy. As Ben Johnson said, the easiest reading is cursed hard writing. And believe me, he worked every word. He might write a paragraph a day, that's all. But every word in that paragraph had been worked on. It might be in the wrong position in the sentence. It might be that he hadn't got the right emphasis in that line. There was a kind of a poet in the man. He had a natural ear for rhythm and cadence. And somehow, when he'd finished, it, it read like he'd just sat down and read, written that line just like that. He didn't. He worked out hard. And for a man who always said that he, he hadn't got 
an attention span of longer than five minutes. It's not true. He worked, he worked, and he did become extremely successful. His books published all over the world. Um, we had people who, uh, Japanese readers, <laughs> were uh, intrigued by a cat we had called Thermal. I won't go into the story of how he came to be Thermal, because it will be here all night. But um, so we looked out of the window one day, and Derek had written in his, his latest book about how Thermal had fallen in love with a wire brush, <laughs> which still lay in the backyard because Derek had been scraping down the uh, wrought iron railings. And he said he looked out of the window and these couple in the backyard and he went out and they said, oh, we come to Japan, we come see Thermal, yeah, Thermal home, yes. <laughs> and the day said, oh, no, I'm sorry he's out at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this sort of thing did happen to Derek a lot. He, he, I mean, he found strange things happen to him, but he embroidered them. I mean, they weren't always absolutely truthful. <laughs> Not absolutely. Well, Joan Trollope was being interviewed on television recently, and she said, uh, the writer's job is not to convey life, but to interpret it in a form that makes it digest digestible for the reader. Mm. <laughs> and this is certainly what Derek did. I mean, he would come, come home and say, I met a weird fellow in the Juicy's Cafe today. And really, what happened? And he would tell me half a story. But by the next day, the story had grown. And this is the story of the man in Juicy's. <laughs> he sat opposite Derek at a little table for two. And Derek sat there, and the, the man was just sitting with folded arms, and then he leaned over, he says, I'm off to Ipswich tomorrow. <laughs> so Derek said, oh, really? What, what's going on in Ipswich? He said, it was said too much already. <laughs> <laughs> so after a bit, he says, promise you won't tell. <laughs> so Derek said, no, I won't tell. He says, well, you see, I go into Ipswich, in my car, he says, with my loud ailer, and I drive round the back streets, and I wind the window down, and I say, your water will be cut off at three o'clock in two hours. <laughs> <laughs> and then I go home. Terry <laughs> <laughs> says, do you do this regularly? He says, oh, ah, he says, I've done Bradford, Bailey, <laughs> 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 So this is how Terry built the story up. I mean, it's a great story when he's finished with it. But only half of it is true. Like, um, Basil Boothroyd was once asked, did all this really happen to you? Is this story true? And Basil said, yes, he said, the stories, the stories that I write, he says, they are true. He says, but they don't, the incidents don't necessarily all happen on the same day. <laughs> and not necessarily in that order. <laughs> and not necessarily to me. <laughs> so anyway, um, I mean, there are thousands of stories that Terry relates that I could tell you about and, and that we could be here all day. But I mean, what I'm really anxious to put across is that his, he will be a legend for a long time because of that love and warmth in his writing. He's being himself, and that's what I would urge you to do the same. Don't ape anybody, be you. Um, I don't know what else I need to say, really. I'd like to tell you about the woman who <laughs> introduced me at a conference in Scotland, and she said, I think she was trying to be Miss Jean Brodie. She said, um, I'd like to introduce you to Miss Elena Whittig. She said, she's written no fewer than 29 novels. She's incredibly promiscuous. <laughs> <laughs> it went all right. Um, but she hadn't finished with me. I think she was determined to demolish me. At the, at the very end, when she was thanking me, she said, um, it's quite a long time, she says, since you brought out a book, Miss Archie, we're all waiting for the next one, she said. 
you lived such a very eventful life, she says, well, with winning the Woman of the Year Award, um, winning the, um, the, the um, Emmy with Derek, and, and uh, it being awarded a doctorate and all that. She says, have you never thought about writing your autobiography? And I said, well, yes, I have, but I said, I think it would have to be uh, published after I've died, I said, because otherwise people's feelings might be hurt. And she said, oh, make it soon, Miss Army <laughs> <laughs> Taylor.